good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for wherever you are in the world. My name is Baron Coilis, and I work at the European Variation Archive. Um, so I handle the uh, any submissions coming into the archive, and also do some uh, data wrangling and some outreach work. Um, essentially, this webinar will cover what the EVA is, but what we want to focus on specifically is the um, RSID release, the clustered variant release, as it's called. Um, this will cover how the data, where the data has come from, and how to consume the data, and how you can then use the data for your own research. So, without taking too much time and introduction, we'll go through some expected outcomes from this webinar. So essentially, as I stated, we'll cover the EVA as a whole and um, how it relates and uh, works with other archives at the European Bioinformatics Institute. We'll then cover what SS and RS IDs are and how they are assigned to individual variants. And then we'll cover how the variant data can then be accessed. There are a number of access methods and some of which will work better for you specifically and some of which will not work as good for you. So we'll see the different methods of how they can be accessed, um, some of which can then be integrated into your own pipelines so data can also be retrieved uh, um, automatically. Just going over a quick roadmap. Um, so what we'll do first is I'll, I'll go over a quick um, overview. This will actually cover the EVA demo as well. So I'll come out the slides and we can go through the EVA website together just to go through the different pages we have and the different methods of data consumption. Um, I'll then go back to the slides for some background information on SS and RSIDs, and then we'll cover the bulk of the webinar, which is the data release. Finally, before uh, the webinar finishes, I'll leave some additional information uh, just to help in um, anything that you wish to use in variant data, such as some variant data templates and um, some contacts you can use to contact us um, if you do have any specific uh, variants you wish to take a look at. So without taking up too much time, we'll move into the overview of the European Variation Archive. So the European Variation Archive, essentially we are a database for genomic variants from any type of species. And we reside in the European Bioinformatics Institute in the Molecular Archives cluster, just at the bottom here. So all the data in the European Bioinformatics Institute is split up into specific clusters, depending on what the data is compromised of. We um, are actually coincide with the European Nucleotide Archive and the European Genome Phenome Archive and Array Express. Uh, these three can, I know the naming can be quite confusing as well as the acronyms. The European Nucleotide Archive actually specializes in any sequence data. So whether that be genome, sequ um, genome sequences, um, nucleotide sequences, they can archive any data related to that. And the European Genome Phenome Archive um, uh, takes care of any uh, human um, confidential data. So essentially they do work quite similar to us, but um, there are quite a few um, sort of uh, gates you have to go through to submit data to the European Genome Phenome Archive. Essentially data just can't be submitted there because that data is confidential. It's done through like a data agent. We also interact with other teams within different clusters. So as you'll see, we also um, have a relationship with biosamples because essentially we archive the metadata related to the variant data we have in the European Variation Archive as well. And you also see, you may have probably use Ensemble, uh, quite a big database and has a number of information um, on genes, variants, but we can also provide information such as a phenotype association, linkage disequilibrium, and other source of, uh, data, sources of data related to the variant information. Uh, at the archive itself, um, just some quick numbers. Um, roughly, we actually contain about 2.4 billion variants at the moment across 240 plus species. The variant data itself um, is, again, from any type of species, whether it be human, um, livestock species, or bacterial species. And that includes within across populations and including subspecies. The metadata associated with the variant data is also contained. And this is uh, provided alongside uh, the variant data itself. 
So as you'll see, as we go through the demo, not only can you consume the variant data, but we also detail where the data came from and the pipeline used to generate the variant data. Lastly, any variant data submitted to us, we also run Ensemble's variant effect predictor to uh, provide some annotation to the variants. So then this does give effects on gene, genes and transcripts, the functional consequence, um, to be specific, the most uh, severe functional consequence. And we also calculate population frequencies for each submission. So that was a quick overview of essentially what the European Variation Archive is. Um, to summarize the overview itself, um, a database for storing any genetic variant, variant data from any species. So if you are working with uh, variant da variation data, you can submit that to us and we also run the effect predictor on it and provide it back via a number of channels, which we're going to take a look at now. So moving on to the actual website, so when you do visit the European Variation Archive, <clears throat> you can follow it through the European Bioinformatics Institute or simply just search uh, EBI EVA. That's usually my preferred way of finding our website, but it is provided by EBI website. This is the homepage, which displays some general information, uh, sort of like a, I'd like to say generic information based on uh, some general information on what we have and some any feedback you want to leave. At the bottom of the page, we have just some general summary statistics, such as the top five species, um, top five types of studies, even though there's quite a few different um, categories there. Um, and we actually split these between the SNPs and um, indels. Uh, what we class as that is anything below 50 base pairs or anything above 50 base pairs, um, not going into chromosomal abnormalities or chromosomal structure changes. So that's how we sort of uh, split the data between uh, SNPs and indels. If you come to the middle of the page, you have what we've put on the home page is a quick uh, search box. So if you are looking for individual SNPs of interest and you know the variant ID and you know the genome build, you can essentially just come to the home page and use this SNP search box to display the variant information. As we go through the demo, you'll see that we just uh, how we display the variant pages for specific variants, and essentially this will bring up that data. So you can select the um, species of interest. So we've got human GC, uh, GRCH37, and we can do uh, put an RSID of one, two, three. Hopefully that should come up with a search result. And we can see the information is provided back by the variant page. So I'll move on to uh, how these are assigned. These are SSIDs, um, and we'll go through the difference between SSIDs and RSIDs as we go through. But I just wanted to show the format of how the data is laid out and related to individual assemblies and the uh, chromosomal location and the type. But that is how to search for individual variants. And this data can also be consumed via our FTP and our API. Um, the data through any of these channels is the same, whether uh, it doesn't really depend on what channel you use, but it literally just depends on preference. The data returned from the website is the same as the data provided from the FTP and API. Again, it just depends on preference. Some people like to use the API because they've integrated it into a pipeline, so variant data can be consumed automatically. Or some people like the FTP simply because you can download them by files, which we'll take a look at at the moment. Heading up at the top, we have our very different pages. Um, I won't go into too much detail for the submit data. But if you are looking to submit data, here's where you'll find all the additional information. So we have the data requirements. Um, to go through them quickly, we receive data in the VCF format, VCF file, sorry. So the variant core format. And we also require a metadata file, which is um, you can download at the bottom page here. And that essentially is a Excel file where you can input all the metadata associated with your study. So again, not to go into too much detail, there's a quite a bit of information here, but if you are going to submit data to the European Variation Archive, essentially visit the submit data page and it will have all the information you need here. And it'll also have our help desk email, which I'll display at the end of this webinar. The help desk email is used to start the submission process. 
but we also it's also the address we accept queries from. So if you do have any queries related to the consumption of data as well, you can send them through to the EVA help desk email, which I'll display at the end of the webinar if you just want to take a note. So we'll move on to the data consumption methods now. In specific, the two uh, main methods that we find users use for the uh, website. So first we have the study browser. So this is if you uh, want to look at a specific study of interest and you want to consume data related to a whole study. Um, we, the schema we follow and the format, we try to keep relatively simple. So we have our filter options on the left-hand side and our results table, results table from any queries on the right-hand side. So on the left, you can filter from variant type, such as a short genetic variant or structural variant, again, specified by anything higher than 50 base pairs. Um, you can also search by text if you are looking for a specific study. And you can also search by genome. So this lists the number of species you currently hold in the EVA. And if you want to search by type as well, if you are looking for studies that are just related to uh, exomic sequences, you can then hit exome sequencing and search by um, that query. Moving on to the results table on the right hand side. So the results page um, will have, we have 14 pages of results of studies at the moment. And this will just display what, um, essentially what data you can consume via different studies. Mm -hmm. So if we go on to a uh, study, we hit the PRJEB number, which is the project accession ID. And this is the number you received when you submit data to us. And it will display the different uh, the um, overall metadata associated with the study, such as the samples used, the genome, and the iron STC accession for the assembly used to discover the variants. Also have the platform used for, from the sequencing pipeline, which generated the uh, data, and a short description provided by the original submitter, just about what the data is, what they found, what the sort of information is related to the uh, variant data. Uh, we also, for some studies, if the original submitter has provided, they can provide a resource such as if they have a specific database online, they'll provide a link to the resource here. And we also have examples of publications you can link directly to your study. So many studies we hold have a publication associated. If you do go to submit data to us as well, um, providing a PubMed ID, we can then link the publication to the actual metadata page of the variants. To get the raw, the raw variant data itself, we have the download section here, which is uh, uh, consists of two different types of links. We have the submitted files link and the browsable files link. Um, to specify on what these are, essentially the submitted files link will be the raw VCF state, uh, the raw VCF files we receive from the submitter. If you actually select the submitted files link, you'll see that it actually takes you to the European nucleotide archive because the way we work at the moment is the data is also submitted to the ENA, the European nucleotide archive. And down here, down the links, this is where you can find, you can download the uh, raw data files as they were received from the submitter. So that is one way to download the data. Um, the reason we submit to the European Nucleotide Archive as well is because they follow a specific schema which allows the project accession to be received. The project accession, again, being the PRJEB ID number, and this is what you'll essentially receive once you've submitted data to us. It seems to be, um, or what uh, submitters generally uh, receive once they submit data, as they need to provide this along with their manuscript to journals for publication. The second download link, so as I said, the submitted file takes you to the ENA. The second download link is the browsable files. So the browsable files actually takes you to the EVA FTP. And you can see the three types of variant files we have. So we have the raw VCF file, the index for the VCF file, and another file, which is uh, also in the uh, uh, variant core format, 
that this contains the variants uh, which have been, so the SSIDs, these variants have been accessioned on our side and have received an ID for each individual variant. So once you download this file, it will uh, have the variants in the variant call format, but also display an SSID associated with those individual variants. I'll show you an example of this um, as we go along. When we go back to the slides, um, I'll have a picture of what exactly this looks like and how this will be useful if you are going to use these files. The actual difference, I mean, the most common question we receive is what's the difference between the two files, um, the two download links, sorry. Um, the, I mean, the main difference is that the submitted files, the, they're downloaded from the ENA. The browsable files are not available until we've run annotation on the variants and we've accessioned the variants. So if you go into a study and you see the browsable files are available, that means that the variants are available via the EVA variant browser and the variants have been accessioned, meaning they received a specific ID associated with each variant. So that covers the study browser. Again, it's very, very useful if you are looking for a, a specific study and you want to download um, data associated with that study as a whole. There are some brief uh, filtering options on the left-hand side and then the queries um, uh, returned on the right-hand side. I wanted to go through the study browser first before moving on to the variant browser. Uh, the variant browser, it does allow a bit more options. Generally, we've tried to follow the same schema and it's laid out in the same format, but as you know, variants are quite complex things, so there are a number of filtering options, um, a bit more than the variant browser, so to speak, that allows uh, variants to be queried and downloaded. So very, very similar uh, layout, um, some filtering options on the left-hand side and the var variant results window on the right-hand side. You can now query by uh, the genome assembly, so you can go to any species or assembly of uh, interest but you can also query by the chromosomal location, the variant ID, such as the, uh, um, the specific ID provided to the, the variant of interest, or you can download, um, sorry, not download, you can query uh, genes um, or specific, uh, the specific genes as a whole. So this naturally starts in uh, the BRCA2 gene, I just removed it. That's used as a default, but that will return all the variants within that specific gene as a whole. And the variant, uh, the uh, VET version we've used to annotate those variants. If you take a look at more filtering options, um, one of the most popular ones is the consequence type. So if you are looking for variants such as strictly coding variants, or if you're looking for strictly non-coding variants, these can be then selected to use as a query. And down the bottom, it just displays these studies that are being returned associated with the query. So again, these will be the studies that can be found in the study browser. But any variants that are queried, we will show the studies down here from which these variants have been uh, reported by. Taking a look at the results window on the right hand side, um, these will return the uh, query results of the variants that you're interested in. They can be increased per page, so you can do 100 variants per page. And it will have things such as the chromosomal position, the variant ID, again, if it's been assigned, the variant ID will be found here, um, the reference and alternative alleles, the class of SNP, and the most severe consequence type provided by um, the ensemble's variant effect predictor. Some variants also, um, the variant effect predictor also provides the polyphen and SIF scores, um, sort of quantifying the effect, the detrimental effect on the protein produced from um, the variant and some additional information regarding um, uh, the, how this, sorry, I just zoom out to look, just um, the individual pages of data that can be consumed. So if we hit the uh, EVA logo, This will take you to the variant page on the EVA website, displaying um, some additional information of the variant, such as the assembly and where the information comes from. Heading further down, well, the consequence type is the integenic variant at the moment, and also the sequence ontology. 
heading further down, um, this will take a look at the files. So what file actually reported this variant and the study this variant was reported by. Also the genotypes per study. So this is split. So this is one study that's reporting this variant and the genotypes provided. And also the population statistics reported by the study for the variant as well. So going back to the output file, um, the output, sorry, the output of the query, you can actually see that, um, let me see if I can move this for you. So I'll just bring up an example of a, So I've just uh, done a quick query for a GRCH uh, chromosomal region um, of human. I just wanted to show you that um, there are also, also for variants additional links. Um, so as I said, we also interact with dbSNP and Ensemble um, to provide additional information for our variants. So if you actually hit the Ensemble page, the Ensemble logo, sorry, this will take you uh, to the page this will take you to the variant page in Ensemble where additional information can also be retrieved related to that variant. The relationship between us and Ensemble is that a lot of the variant information um, displayed on Ensemble is actually retrieved from the EVA as the uh, raw um, variant is initially submitted to the EVA. And then additional information can be found if you are looking for phenotype data associated with the variant. That can then be retrieved from the Ensemble website if you are looking for that. And if you also hit the dbSNP link, this will also take you to the dbSNP equivalent um, resource for the variant of interest. So again, these are just ways that the uh, information is um, kept consistent between databases and information is shared between different databases. A lot of the variant information is consumed from our website to display in other databases. Um, reason being is that when we do accession variants, essentially this keeps an ID on specific variants so then they can be cross-referenced. So going back to the actual EVA website, um, I won't go into too much detail on other uh, the, these pages. So these are just some general information pages for us. So we have a global alliance for genomic health beacon, API beacon. And then we actually have the uh, general e, uh, API help page. So this will detail you on how you can use our API. Um, we also have an available Swagger API page that can be used. And I'll also have some details on some example queries that can be used uh, uh, use, um, using our API. So for example, if you wanted to uh, fetch uh, information on a specific study. I'll click on this one here. Shouldn't be too too much of a heavy request. This will then display the API result as a JSON in a JSON format, and which can be passed and used integrated into specific pipelines. We find that if you generally use the API, <clears throat> most likely you're more familiar with computational methods of access. So that just allows this option of uh, data consumption, uh, essentially computational methods through the EVA API. Um, I'll go onto our release page in a moment, but I wanted to just go onto our help page. Um, I know it's not usually something that will be covered, but again, it just has some general help information on variants. But if you go onto the submission header, if you go down, there is a section on how do I generate a VCF file. One of the most common uh, questions we do receive is um, how to sort of represent the variant data or the raw variant data from a pipeline in VCF and how do you convert that. This section just contains some useful information and some useful software on how essentially to convert your data into uh, VCF. But it also has a VCF template file. So if I just open that up. So this is a short VCF template file, which contains um, some examples. So um, 
if you are just reporting a single or a handful number of variants, instead of sifting through how many different types of software to try and generate um, a VCF file, essentially you can download this, enter your variant information into it, and then you can convert that into a VCF from Excel. So just going back onto the website, I wanted to cover the RS release. So again, a big part, a big part of our work has been um, the release, the RS release of data. So our first release took place last year, September. And this meant that all the non-human variant data from dbSNP was ingested into the EVA and then released via this first release last year, September. This release now, it contains the same, it also contains that dbSNP data, but we've essentially added to that data based on the submissions coming into us. So this adds another 161 million variants from around another 29 studies. Those have then been made available. Um, those variants from those studies have then been accessioned, clustered together, and then made available via this uh, release two, which came out this week. This is a, a, the, on the, if you visit the EVA um, website, this is the page you want to go for additional information, but we'll be covering this back in the slides now. So I just, again, I just wanted to go through the website just to detail and show you live the different pages we have. Um, again, it would be nice if, uh, once you figure out what you're looking for, if you go through those pages and see there's some additional information on each of those, just to see how to consume data. And if you, again, if you do uh, are looking for anything in specific that you can't find, you can leave us a message via the EVA help desk email and we can uh, dig into the data for you as well. But moving on, I want to talk about the bulk of the webinar, which is the SS and RS ID data consumption. So essentially how variants are assigned these IDs, what these IDs mean and how they can be consumed and how they can be used as well. So starting off, um, many of you may have heard of RSIDs. I believe RSIDs are the more popular uh, variant and more widely referenced whether you're reading publications on gen genome variation. However, they actually are derived, well not derived, but they're based on SSIDs. So an SSID is uh, essentially a numeric ID and it's unique for each variant based on the uh, assembly used, the study it's come from, which is an important factor, chromosomal position and the reference and alternative allele. The reason we have study listed in bold is because the study origin is what the SSID is, is one of the most important factors of why an SSID is an SSID. If we go on to this slide, an example is that if we have a submission from a study that says they've reported a variant on GRCH37, um, chromosome two, position 10, and it's a C to a T, um, change that will be submitted to the EVA and then we'll provide a ID to that variant. So this will be provided an example, an SSID um, triple one. We may then receive another submission um, from an institute on the other side of the world reporting the same type of variant. So GRHCH37, um, chromosome two, position 10, C to T, exactly the same, reporting exactly the same variant but then that variant will be an, um, assigned an ID of SS222. Same thing again with the third example, um, same variant being reported from a different consortium or different institute, that even though they are the same variant, that variant would then be assigned an SSID of 333 for an example. So these, although these are different uh, studies and different institutes reporting, because they were, even though they are reporting the same variant, that variant will still then receive a different SSID. So we find that SSIDs, we return them to the submitter once we've, they've been assigned, and then they can be used to reference a variant that is specific to that study or specific to your study. So if you do want to reference your variants specifically to your study, 
it would be good to use the SSID. Where the release comes into play and what we've actually done with RSIDs is that an RSID is then um, all the same, all, all the SSIDs that are reporting the same variant clustered into a single RSID. So in this example, these three SSIDs would be clustered into this single RSID. And then this single RSID is then what is uh, predominantly um, referenced in publications. We find that it's a good thing to reference the RSID in your publication or in your work, because essentially when you do reference an RSID, you're providing sort of a backup and providing evidence that, look, I've reported this variant, it's been received, this is RSID, but if you look into this RSID, you'll find that other consortiums or other studies have also reported the same variant. So essentially it provides more information and more of uh, evidence that your variant is indeed a variant and it has been reported by other external um, institutes and external studies. So this page just uh, described an RSID. So um, essentially we have a periodic, we cluster them periodically. Um, the timeline for that is every six months. So we receive a batch of submissions within those six months, assign them SSIDs, and then at the end of the six months, we'll cluster all those SSIDs into RSIDs. And then those are made available via the iterations of our release, which in this case, release two has just been uh, done. If you look at the criteria for the SSIDs, they're exactly the same as an SSID, except that the study isn't involved simply because an RSID isn't unique to a specific study because it incorporates all the SSIDs from individual studies into one single RSID. And the last and very important note to make of an RSID is that an RSID is preserved when the variant is remapped to a new, newer version of the reference sequence or a different version of the reference sequence, should we say. This is important thing to mention just because the whole point of an RSID is to keep things consistent that the variant can be cross-referenced. So if you see an RSID of 123, which I like to use as an example, you know that that RSID is very specific to that variant. If you see it in a different database, you know what that RSID relates to and you know the origin of that RSID and what the, uh, it's, it's essentially preserved through different genome builds. And so that's why RSIDs are more widely referenced within publications and when discussing um, uh, genome variation. Um, this is the brief, what I wanted to move on to now is the different methods of consuming this data. So we provide the SSIDs, we then provide the RSIDs and our releases, but then how is this data displayed? How is it consumed and how can you use it? Well, uh, many of you may be familiar with the example. This is a VCF file example. Um, this big chunk at the top, although it looks quite complicated, is the metadata information. So these are the metadata lines, and then you can see the variant lines at the bottom. So you can actually see that this variant relates to on this line is chromosome 20, position 14370. And you can see the RSID here. So this, you know that this variant is relating to RSID. This is the um, ID that this variant has been assigned. And then the metadata information lines on the right-hand side. So we know that AF is equaling 0 0.5. If we then take a look at the information lines, which is what these provide, we look at AF. We know that AF, the description of AF is a little frequency. So we then know that AF for this, the little frequency for this, um, variant is uh, 0 0.5, um, it was preserved half. Sort of same thing with the format, except the format can be used for individual samples. So we have the format field and then sample one, sample two, and sample three. If we take a look at GT, in the meta information lines, we can see that GT equals just uh, genotype. So we can see that the first sample is homozygous reference. The second sample is heterozygous, and the third sample is heterozygous reference. Um, this is provided by this genotype coding and nomenclature, so zero, zero, so zero, meaning the reference allele, which in this case is G, and one relating to the alternative allele, which in this case is A. I think this is better 
taken a look at in the um in the third variant actually because the third variant has two different types of reference allele oh I'm sorry alternative allele so in this case for the first sample we can see that um uh, uh this allele uh, this, it will, that, that would be g and the number two would relate to the second type of alternative allele which would be t where a zero would be the reference allele which is a but again um the VCF format is uh, essentially the bread and butter we work with, um, how data is received, how we receive data, as well as how we return data. And it seems to be the, the output, the final output of many bioinformatic pipelines of how to represent variant data, essentially attempting to keep things consistent within the bioinformatics community. So the reason I mentioned VCF files is because, again, that's how we receive them. So this is an example of a simple VCF file with the header line and the variance received. And how do we return the accessioned VCF file? So again, once we receive the variant data, we then provide the SSIDs and they're provided, uh, they're returned in VCF files or the EVA website. And as you can see, the ID column, which was left blank in the initial submission, now has SSIDs assigned to these individual variants here. So you'll find that you'll receive, essentially you've received the same VCF file you submitted to us, but it will now contain SSIDs you can use to reference the individual variants. So going on to the bulk of release two, what it, uh, the different file types it has and what it actually means. So for release two, this brings our total up to 218 species um, across uh, 907 million clustered variants, compromising over 907 million clustered variants. This is the total from release one and release two. Um, release two added another 161 million variants uh, across another 20 additional 29 species. But for our release channel, this will be the bulk of variants that are included in the releases. Um, for the next iteration of releases, again, I wanted to sort of uh, clarify that we don't remove data from the, the next iteration of releases. Essentially, the data is built upon. So release two added data to an already existing release, which was release one from last year, and added more data to that release. And that's how it will work going forward. We'll, as we receive submission data, we'll add accession dolls and add this data on top of um, the data included in the previous release. So when you do go to consume the data, um, if you go to consume the release data via our FTP, which was announced, you'll find that for each build, for each um, genome assembly, you'll find five different file types. So I'll go through them individually. But the main file type I wanted to concentrate on is the current IDs, which is the one essentially you'll be working with and the one that will most likely contain your variant of interest. So the current IDs, they contain the active variants that satisfy the EVA submission requirements. That means that we were able to map these variants to an iron STC register assembly, meaning a genome assembly, a genome sequence even, that is resides in NCPI, ENA, or the DNA Data Bank of Japan. And we have relevant data associated with this variant to classify as a variant. So we know we have a little frequency and we have the genotype information. Um, these are RSIDs. Um, these RSIDs are also provided on the EVA website, as I stated before and as shown. And the contig uh, chromosome names are provided in the header. So on the example here, we can see chromosome one. Um, I've cut it off here, but in the header lines, it simply displays what chromosome one relates to and what its INSDC accession is. So for this example, we know that this is a dog genome. We know that chromosome 35 was assigned an accession of this from NCBI. And also the link to the original study is also provided in the VCF. We'll take a look at this on the next slide, but essentially this shows that um, in the information section, you'll see that the, the title of the study, which, uh, which uh, are reporting these, are the, these variants is also provided in the VCF file. So essentially when you download this VCF file for release two, 
you'll receive the chromosomal position of the variants, the ID, the reference and alternative allele, but you'll also receive the information of where these variants originated from. So an example can be seen here. So in the metadata lines I was talking about, so this will be the top of the VCF, which is where you can provide more information. We can see that the info SID and the description of that relates to the identifier of the study that reported the variant. This is to the right of the variant line. You can see that SSID from here equals the uh, broad um, uh, institute, um, sorry, a canine study from the broad institute. And this is where essentially that variant was um, reported from. That's where that variant was reported from. So it just provides um, some metadata that you can see within the VCF file. So once you download the VCF file, you can use that straight away to sort of gather information on the variant and see what information is also associated with the variant directly. So the merge current IDs files, these are the ones, just to summarize what these files, this file is, these are the ones that will most likely be used because these are the current RSIDs. These are the ones we have enough evidence for to say, look, this is a variant. We've received external information such as uh, different studies um, reporting this variant. So we've clustered it into a single RSID. And these will be the ones that are used in the community. So these will be the RSIDs you'll see referenced in publications and being used um, uh, cross-referenced between publications or uh, different databases. Moving on to the second, um, the second file that will be available. So this will be the multi-mapped IDs. So these will be RSIDs that were actually previously assigned by dbSNP. Um, before we started accessioning in 2017, um, this was dbSNP's responsibility. So we still contain some legacy data that has been assigned from dbSNP, simply because some studies are still using, we're referencing this, and it will be, we still wanted to make this data regularly available. So they are still valid, valid RSIDs, but we couldn't precisely locate where they were. And the, so what we've done is the VCF file in the information lines, it contains all the possible locations that this RSID could be referring to. Again, we have feedback that these files, they're not very, they're not as widely used as the current IDs, current IDs, which for obvious reasons will be more widely used. But mainly if someone is going over a legacy study, we'll find that they may find an RSID within one of these files. Same thing with the third set of files. So these will be titled merged IDs. So these are RSIDs, um, essentially they shouldn't be used and they've been merged into another active RSID. So they are searchable on the EVA website, but the link to the parent RSID will be provided. So sometimes with RSIDs, they are assigned um, in order, but you may find that if you look on RSID, it may state that it's not being used anymore. And it may be a reason that the parent, us, the parent RSID, the RSID that has been moved into um, is currently being used because it contained correct information, it contained more information. And these IDs, essentially they shouldn't be used, but they are there just in case they are still referenced within the community. So if you are going through a publication and you see one of these IDs, you'll search it on the EVA website. The EVA website will provide the information related to the RSID. They'll then say this RID, this RSID has been clustered under a different RSID and it'll provide them information for that as well. For the full set of files, these are deprecated RSIDs. So these are RSIDs that should also not be used. I know we're providing a lot of RSIDs and telling you not to use them, but again, it's, um sort of trying to preserve information that was done previously, um, trying to preserve that, but also essentially trying to deprecate that information as well. So we are providing these, but um, they either not used due to information such as missing information. Um, we couldn't find the assembly that was used. They have previously been assigned because RSIDs have been uh, assigned for years now. So we're trying to, again, preserve this information that these RSIDs were previously assigned to, 
but detail why they shouldn't be used or what information is missing. So if you do download the deprecated IDs, if you are looking at a legacy study, you may find it in this list of deprecated IDs here. And lastly, you'll find now we have the merged deprecated IDs. So these are IDs that shouldn't be used as well, but because they have been merged into an RSID that was deprecated later on. So similar to the third RS, the merged RSIDs that we found, um, these were initial RS, RSIDs. Um, similarly, they have been then clustered into a different, they have been moved into a different RSID, but then the RSID has then been deprecated. Um, again, we also provided this just to preserve the data and preserve the information that has been assigned to these variants and that was reported. But ideally, they shouldn't, they'll rarely be used only if um, we're looking for RSIDs that may have been lost somewhere down the years. So um, we have about 13 minutes left. Um, I just want to go through some takeaway messages and give you some additional information as well. Um, useful things to take away and some useful um, tools and links that you can use for variant data. So just to cover everything, um, the EVA essentially provides it's a permanent archival store for accession and genetic variant variation data from any species. We receive the data in VCF and the associated metadata file. Um, the submission process is started by contacting the help desk. We then archive the information provide an ID for you to use in your publication, but also accession the individual variants themselves. And then we provide this information back um, to the submitter directly, but also via our different channels, such as the EVA um, user interface, um, our FTP and API. The SS and, ID, S, the SS and RSIDs, again, can be retrieved via these different channels. And the submission request, um, you find that if you are going to submit a manuscript to a journal, they'll ask for evidence that the uh, variant data has been submitted to an archive. That essentially means the raw data will need to come to us. Um, before I go on to the final slide, I just wanted to take a look at the FTP as I didn't cover it. So this is the FTP. Um, if you go into our uh, FTP, you'll see that we have the data from release one and release two. Again, the data is preserved through releases. Uh, we just add data on top of that. So if you go to the latest release, you can either search by species or assembly. If we go by species, we've tried to keep the name consistent. So these are all the species we'll have the data for. So we'll go for something. I'll go for dog. Um, and then we'll have the different types of um and then we'll have the different types of files to be able to download. So if we go into this genome build, um as seen in the examples, we have the current SIDs, the index file, and the different types of files. If you do need additional information on specific builds and what the files mean, um, there's also these readme files that you can then download and read through, which will then, um, again, go over the information I covered in the webinar in related to each individual file. But this is the uh, release two FTP information that was uh, recently done. Um, I'll have the date on the site, it's actually only done quite recently, but. So again, um, as we come out with new and new, more and more releases, they'll be available via the FTP channels. And you can essentially find them at this website here um, during the FTP there. And lastly, this is the team that has been working on everything. Um, we've really had some uh, members of staff leave, but we're continuing to work through and uh, be able to provide you these releases. Uh, just for the last page, um, I'll go on to the last page of the webinar in a moment, but um, these are some useful information. Um, so this is actually the validation suite we've developed. So apart from the EVA website, there's also this validation suite. Um, it's the same tools we use to validate uh, VCFs that come into the website. So if you do visit it on our GitHub page, um, you can download this onto your local machine. 
and this will contain information such as the VCF validator and the VCS assembly check. The VCF validator is a tool you can use to run um, on your VCF files and it will display whether they're valid VCF files or invalid, um, meaning that a valid invalid VCF file may contain a number of errors, such as uh, an example is if a little frequency for one of the variants is listed above one, which is impossible, not possible, but it, it, it will list that as an error, or if there's some additional white space in the file, anything format wise or anything um, that in, in the regards to the data doesn't make sense in variant terms the VCF validator will highlight it and then it will display the error that is being returned. But then it also contains the assembly check, which is essentially, it checks all the reference, reference alleles in the VCF file and to ensure that the reference alleles in the VCF file match the reference alleles from the uh, uh, reference assembly, reference genome or sequence used. I went through, uh, I didn't go through too much of the help page, but I hope it is, uh, it's very, very useful simply because it displays some useful software and tools used to create uh, VCF files, as well as the template file it contained, which is, I find it's more easier to use and more useful if you are just reporting a single variant or if you are just reporting one or two variants. Again, instead of going through how many different types of software to try to find something that can generate this, the, you can just input the um, the information directly into the template file, and there's some instructions of how to save the file in in uh, into a uh, VCF file. So change the Excel data into uh, VC variant call format data. And lastly, um, our group is a contributor to the official VCF specification. Um, this makes sense as we receive VCF files and we also provide VCF files. So we're also quite passionate about the VCF specification and keep ensuring that variant data represented representation of variant data is kept consistent, clear and concise. And this will just be the link to the VCF specification, which is updated uh, every couple of weeks or months or so. And it just provides details on the variant call format. Um, again, how you can represent things such as structural variants and uh, Different tools, different types of variants within the actual VCF, uh, within the actual variant call format. Um, we know that variants are they they can be very very complex complex. So again, the specification tries to ensure that every different type, every different corner case of variant can be represented correctly within the variant call format. And lastly, um, just to finish up everything, um, this, I'm pretty sure um, EJ will confirm this, but this uh, webinar will be made available by the Train Online website. Um, so if you do need to have any questions, um, you can send them through to the EVA help desk. Again, this will be, it, it's used for submissions, but it's also our direct point of contact. So if you are looking for, if you are having trouble consuming data or uh, submitting data, or you wish to look for a specific variant of interest which you can't find, you can send this through to the EVA help desk and we can try to dig into this data for you and try and find any information that you need. And we're also welcoming feedback um, for this webinar as well as for the actual EVA releases. Essentially, when we make these releases, um, we have data in our backend, but we want to ensure that the way we provide this data is as clear and as useful as possible. So if you find that the data could be represented better or you think that uh, some files are not needed, please do provide us feedback, um, message us via the EVA help desk and we'll try to incorporate uh, the feedback we receive into future releases. So not only is the data built upon, but the format and how we present the data will also be improved as well. And on that note, um, Thank you for listening. It's, it's it's always a pleasure to present data on VCF, um, something that we do every day, and it's our bread and butter. So we're quite passionate about the VCF specification and the VCF variant call format. Um, again, thank you for listening, and I hope the information from the webinar as well as from the release provides useful to you in your own work. And you find, um, if you are looking for variants, you find what you're looking for in abundance, and Again, last time, thank you for listening, and I'll pass it back over to our trainer. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Baron. Thank you very much.
uh, for today's webinar and I would like to thank all the attendees uh, who attended the webinar today. Uh, and now, um, so if you have uh, questions, please keep on typing them in the chat box. We already have three questions, uh, Baron, for you. Uh, I'll, I'll read it out. So we had one question from Sriram that can we submit bacterial genome variants data? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is actually something we're targeting in the coming months. Um, to specify it's from any species, so bacterial data is something we're eager to receive. We have some at the moment, but not as much as other species. So we're always, always eager to retrieve this. The only thing is that we need to ensure that the reference genome assembly used or the reference sequence does reside in NCPI or the ENA. But yeah, we, we can receive that. Right. So we have uh, another question from David. For submission of variants, should all variants that are called be submitted and therefore include some false positives? And if so, are these annotated as low quality by EVA? Or should only high quality, high confidence variants be submitted and therefore potentially have false negatives? I would say in the past, what we've reserved is that even if there are low quality variants, they have been still being included in the VCF file. Um, simply because when we run the annotation or when we do the population statistics, this will highlight them as low quality variants. So although they won't be omitted from any output files, they'll still be displayed as well the data be seen as unusual and um it just depends on uh, the, the whoever's using it or whoever's consuming it if they find that they don't want to use it because it's a low quality variant then i think um that that will, that will be their choice but we do still um provide this data so and again we encourage people to still include that within the uh, vcf files all right, uh, so we had one question from Catherine and she believes you have answered it, but if you could confirm that, what do you mean by clustered variants when you call clustered variants? No, sure. Yeah, it's, uh, this is the one we always try to, try to explain this as clear as possible, but it's very difficult. So the clustered variants are, um, again, once we receive different submissions, uh, different, uh, once we received variants from different submissions, uh, sometimes we receive submissions containing different variants, but sometimes those variants between different submissions are the same. In that respect, the variants that are the same from different submissions, those are then clustered into a single RSID. So I think it's the individual variants receive the SSID, but then the SSIDs are clustered into a single RSID. So when we say clustered variant, essentially we're referring to an RSID. It's just preference between naming. It's something we've been trying to see in the community, which they prefer either saying the clustered variant or RSID. But yeah, it's, it's simply just an RSID. That's good. Uh, so another question from Catherine is, uh, if genomes have been submitted to NCBI sequence read archive with a bio project accession, will the variants into EVA anyway, or should they be submitted separately? Oh, they they they'll they should be submitted to us. Um, although they are, so even though the bio project is generated by NCBI, um, the variant data when it's submitted to us in the metadata file, you can specify the bio project ID that you it the it's been assigned, and we'll link the data from the E that you've submitted to the EVA to the bio project as well. So again, it should be submitted separately to us, the variant data, but um, there, there's fields there where you can link. If you've already been assigned a bio project or a bio study ID, we'll link the data to the ID instead. All right, thank you. So if, uh, oh, we have uh, another question coming in. I guess it's about the, the variant submission between prokaryotes, eukaryotes, and what? I mean, in the meth, uh, in the submission methods, no, the, 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 there won't be any difference. Um, I know that it's quite different studies, but if you take a look at the metadata, we do, um, there's not much difference in the way it's submitted. We all receive it through the same type of uh, files. All right, so if we have uh, no further questions, I would like to thank Baron again for today's webinar and uh, thank you all for listening.